this is, I do believe is being recorded. So, so we we basically had a little bit of a, a little look at bricks last week. Now, in an archaeological context, bricks are, are really useful pieces of archaeological evidence to identify Roman sites. Now, beyond that, how far are bricks useful to archaeology? In fact, bricks are very useful to interpreting how Tudor buildings develop. Uh, bricks were used in the medieval period. And one important use of bricks is their reuse from Roman buildings into Anglo-Saxon buildings. Now, there's a church called Bricksworth Church in Northamptonshire. It's called All Saints at Bricksworth Church, Northamptonshire. Now, this, this is entirely fascinating. And I've got an article here, which I'm not going to read out in full. But what I will say is we do find at Bricksworth Church that a, a large amount of the stone and brick used at Bricksworth actually comes from Roman buildings. Now, this is rather interesting because when I talk about medieval churches, I talk about minster churches or main churches being where different parishes would bring bricks and stones to, to assist the church to be constructed in my context in, in the Anglo-Saxon period. Now, Bricksworth is a minster church in Northamptonshire and that very thing is happening that different parishes from different areas comes to the mother church to assist in the construction of the mother church, the minster. So you've got the minster, all the parish churches, and that's what Bricksworth was. And we see that borne out extremely well. We, we do see from the seven, eight hundreds that this wonderful Anglo-Saxon church is being developed and where the material is coming from is a large number of parishes. Now, what, what, we, what we can say with Bricksworth, they're using a lot of stone for its construction, not just Roman brick, but stone from different regions as well. And what we can say is that when we do examine stone from Bricksworth, it comes from places like Leicester and even places such as Tokester if you know the Northamptonshire area. But I think the point, the point I'm trying to make is that churches do inevitably in the Anglo-Saxon period reuse Roman material. Now we do know of at least 250 churches in Britain that are of Anglo-Saxon origin. Many purport to be of Anglo-Saxon origin, but there's about 250. And there's at least 50 of those that has a massive level of fabric that reuses Roman material. Now on the Colchester trip we visited a, a church in the middle of nowhere that was constructed out of Roman stone and Roman brick and other material that once was associated with the Roman fort. So one thing that we will see an example of in a short while is these Roman bricks are really useful for the construction of arches because they're flat, they're, they're, they're really um, versatile and they're not lumpy and so on like bricks are, uh, like stones are. And the bricks themselves <laughs> are quite light actually compared with stones. So, so bricks are a really useful building material. Indeed, the architectural features at Bricksworth bear such a striking resemblance to the standing Roman walls at Leicester each with their brick arches supporting on large sandstone blocks that one could reasonably suggest that the Saxons were making a deliberate attempt to copy the architectural example and construction of methods of the Romans from Leicester, even perhaps attempting to, to dismantle Roman buildings and rebuild them at places like Bricksworth. So what we could say there is that the, the Anglo-Saxons the Saxons and Angles and the different peoples who are purportedly coming over in the five, six, seven hundreds and so on are taking Roman buildings and dismantling and rebuilding them somewhere else using exactly the same architectural styles, using exactly the same materials. And that's what's going on. That's what we think. And you know what? It would have been absolutely great to look at Bricksworth as a study 
um, and what they've done with Brooksworth, they've worked out where all the little patches of stone from and brick come from at Brixworth, and they've linked them to different Roman buildings and villas in the area. It's a great study. So if you ever do get to look at Brixworth, I, I would really recommend it. So Brixworth, and interesting enough, it's not brick as in B-R-I-C-K, it's brick as in B-R-I-X-worth, Brixworth, Brixworth. And the word worth is associated with lots of Anglo-Saxon sites as well, out of interest. So I wanted to just start off with that, actually. And um, last week, last week, I'd just like to have a bit of a recap. So historically, when, when we think about bricks, bricks are, are the main choice building material, material in British building today. We, we, we see, for example, whole towns being erected due to brick, um, brickworks being placed up in the late 1800s when stone is being stone is running out it's easier to build our brick than it is stone brick bricks bricks are um, the same sizes you're able to build arches and lintels and all sorts of things with them and buildings go up quite easily using brick the image behind us will actually come up, come on to in a minute so brick is a well-known building material when when we think about brick being used in a British context, we, we think about brick being used from the Roman period onward. But I, I need to hasten a warning there, because what we do see is when we look in a prehistoric context, the, the Iron Age context and even earlier, we, we do actually see brick like things being found. And so you're excavating on a prehistoric site and there's things that, that are baked clay and, and, and it looks like brick, right? But what you're really excavating is the daub as associated with Watland daub structures. So you've got your round houses, the Watland daub structure is burnt down to the ground and the, the daub itself is, has been baked, has, has, you know, has, has been baked in tremendous temperatures that the building um, was affected by when the building went up in smoke so those things peel off and and they they go into fragments of little bits of brick uh, it's not brick per se it's actually daub that's been heated by fires and then giving you that brick effect so that's that's a bit of word of warning but actually proper brick being used is being introduced by the roman civilization into britain from ad 43 onwards it's likely that we do see the prevalence of brick manufacture going beyond the Roman period, but because there's so many Roman town cities and villas that there's brick lying around, you don't really need to make your own brick because it's readily available. You can just rip it out of walls and, and so on. It's probably in about by about the 10 hundreds that we actually start to see brick manufacture really starting to happen in Britain again when the Roman buildings have either been pulled down or the, you know, everything's, you know, places like London, places like London, where they're starting to really expand in, in about the 10 hundreds and by about the reign of King Canute by about um, 10, 30 odd, you, you've got the likes of them needing to start to produce brick because the Roman buildings have either been being used or they've been pulled down and now you need to, build up an industry. There's only, there's only so much recycling you can actually do. So the brick tradition has been going on for quite some time, you know, 5,000 years or more, but not in Britain, when, when you look at the likes of the Sumerian world and so on and so on. Essentially, essentially as we said last week, brick, brick is clay which has been fired and heated. But we also mentioned sort of mud brick that's just been sort of warmed in the sun and you know that, that's something that we see in lots of places um so the origins of brick making can be seen written up in lots of publications and there's one one, one here the encyclopedia of vernacular architecture of the world and you can see a lot of brick being used in that publication from 1997 a guy by the name of oliver and it, so it is claimed that the earliest prevalent known examples of used fired brick, as we've done a lecture on this, was the Indus Valley culture. 
going back four and a half thousand years ago. Um, that technique spread westwards to Samaria and the landscape of Mesopotamia around the delta of the of Tigris and the Euphrates. And of course, we, we, we look at a couple of images in regards to good old Babylon, the Assyrians and good old Babylon. One of the uh, one of the one of the things to be said about Saddam Hussein from the 1980s into the 1990s was his rebuilding of places like Babylon using traditional methods and the mud brick and so on. And you know, it was almost as if the the age of the mud brick had come back and the, the mud brick then being fired and we, we, we see that coming back in sort of reconstructions. So you've got the mud brick, you've got the baked brick, you've got the fired brick, all that sort of starts to come into its own in the Valley of the Indus Valley culture. So let's let's allow Anne in on this one. So moving moving east, what we see is bricks being used in the construction of many civilizations in India and Southeast Asia. In China, brick production is really within its own by around 200 years B BC, baked brick, fired brick, rather than just normal everyday mud brick. So we got there about 200 years BC, where we we're actually getting furnaces for fired brick. So the earliest structure so far found, which has been interpreted as evidence for brick making, comes from India, where a structure interpreted as a brick kiln, the one behind me, was excavated at Lothal in um, Ahmadabad, district of um, Bombay. And this dates as a kiln, um, a mud brick kiln from around 200 years BC. So that's 4,000 years ago. I'm, I'm, I've actually, I, I saw another image and I think the interpretation was wrong. I think this is a rather a structure rather than a mud brick kiln actually, um, but um, a fired kiln, but anyway, so what I'll do, I, I'm going to I'm going to go on to the speak. Uh, let, let's sort of go on to the the images of these bricks. If I can just give me a minute to get them up and loaded. Where are my little babies? There you go. Oh no, that's the wrong one. Mata 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 bingo. Let's just sort of have this up behind me. Uh, <coughs> um, bingo. So right, let's. Uh, good good for you to join us. Uh, Sorry, I'm late. Oh, don't worry, Anne. We, we, we expected you to be late. All right. <laughs> so again, whether this is actually indicative of a, a, a kiln, it, it doesn't look like a kiln to me. But anyway, this is obviously a brick, brick building um, made from the fired brick from around 2000 years BC at Lothal. And then then what we what we do see is that some of the, the earliest earliest kilns uh, structures that you find a huge clamp in the ground. So basically a huge clamp is, is a huge hole in the ground um, and usually a circular hole in the ground and with, with a, um, a stoke hole and with a furnace and obviously the heating of the brick there at the temperatures required. And what we then start to go on to is other areas of the world. And then we, well, let's just, let's just keep back there actually, looking at those, those types of bricks. What, what we do then see in, in other parts of the landscape of India, they've got large, fairly large brick kilns. And these brick kilns fired kilns can actually go to a temperature of about 1000 degrees C. So they're able to really mass, mass manufacture bricks and they're able to use these in massive building projects. Now, some such building projects uh, are looking at when we look at the likes of these great ziggurats in association with the Sumerian cities of um, Erek, Eridu, Lagash and Ur. And what we do see with these types of localities that fired kiln fired bricks, kiln fired bricks are uh, used on the outside of the structures and then the inside of the structures are actually sun baked bricks. So you've got two types of bricks being used at the same time. So you've got the technology of just making the bricks and they're sun baked for the core of these mm -hmm. and the external nature of the buildings are actually fired brick. So these are actually used on the external of the building 
and the reason why these the reason why these look like big mounds of mud is because the cores of them are mud bricks that have just been heated in the sun but the other ones that are used on the outside are fired of fired bricks and this this takes us to a period again of over two over four thousand years ago with the landscape of Samaria and then we start to think about bricks being used and I'm just going to say hello to the good lady Michelle hello Michelle Oh, and, and do you know what I've just been given as a Christmas present, Bill? I've been given Eccles cakes. Ooh. And do you know what? You know, I'm have an interruption a minute. This is a moment, Michelle. Yeah. Can I have a cup of tea, darling? Yeah. And you've got some mushrooms in the pan. And if you heat them up, you can make yourself a wonderful sandwich. It goes both ways. <laughs> so Eccles cakes with a cup of tea. We'll share that. Now, so we, we've... We're starting to go on to evidence of furnaces and so on. And then we go on from the Sumerian, one of the Sumerian cities. And then we go on to the Babylonians and the Assyrians. Now we're looking at Nimrud and we're thinking about the Assyrian king. What, what we do find is the technique of brick making is, is very much highly advanced by the time you get to about 800 years BC and and it's it's so advanced by about 800 years BC that that other things are starting to happen which which we'll go on to in a moment what we do find is that lots of bricks are being at this stage people are writing on them they're basically saying I made this brick or it's associated with a great leader and bricks bricks are stamped into and this this is where this is where the modern brick comes from, really. The modern fired brick, where you 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 have you have in the frog, which is that inverted bit in, in the brick, where you've got the stamp of the company that makes a brick. This is where these ideas come from. So it's, it's a really old idea that you want to put your maker's mark on it, or you want to associate this with a with a great leader. So what 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 we do have in 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 my very notes here is an Assyrian leader at Nimrud, the same site that this, this brick in front comes from, another Assyri Assyrian leader known as Asura Nasir, dating just before this leader, actually the leader before Shalmaneser III, Asur Nasir, who reigns from 883 to 859 BC. He, he's very much into having his name put onto the bricks. So we've got his name inscribed on bricks at Nimrud. So everlasting bricks, everlasting name. You know, this this is what this is what's happening with the brick. It, it's it's a way of leaving a mark on civilization. And and this this brick here, a brick of Shal Manessa the third, dating from eight five eight to eight three nine. It it reads. Um, I can't read the cuneiform, but we'll see what the translation said. Shal Manasseh, a great king, strong king, king of the universe, king of Assyria, son of Ashur and Nasir Pal the, the second, great king, strong king, king of the universe, king of Assyria. He's definitely a king. Uh, I think we get that. Son of Tula Tukulati Neturnata the second, who was also king of the universe and king of the Assyria. Construction of the ziggurat of Kala. So there you go. Um, Nimrud, the ziggurat of, of Kala at Nimrud. So they, there we go. And you can, you can see this on the brick. So, so he means business and his name has survived. So we know exactly who he is. And what then comes next? Is decorated and pattern bricks. So, with with the with the advent of with with the advent of bricks that that are there to build buildings rapidly, and they're they're no longer sun baked bricks; they're fired bricks. You actually have bricks with designs on them, and lots lots of these bricks with designs on them come from the the evolution of brick technology with the likes of the Assyrian there, there are other people doing it before 
And I think we looked at that in regards to the Indus people, but the people who are actually taking it to a new level are the Assyrians. And you can see a nice little design on this. So you can imagine that they're portraying a portraying a goat It's quite clear on this brick. And what you then have is, is various pattern bricks. And I know we mentioned pattern bricks in connection with the um, Indus Valley people. But when, which, which is looking a thousand, five hundred years before the dates that we're talking about now, but pattern bricks and wall bricks come into their own in regards to Babylon and the Ishtar Gate, which I'm sure some of you will have actually come across. And look at these wonderful designs. And th th there you go. They, 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 they're really, from this, they're really going for it. Look at that. Wow. Now, this is, this is from the Ishla, Ishla Gate, Ishtar Gate, I would say. So what, what, what we're really seeing is pattern bricks and wall tiles with colored glazes and had brick um, friezes decorated in relief. So in other words, what you've got bricks is actually coming out 3D out of the wall. It, you know, they're, they're, they're coming out of the wall in relief. So you, you can actually see the mane of the lion there and he looks extremely proud. What this entire gate would have looked at at Ishtar would have been absolutely amazing at Babylon. Now, th these, these tiles here that are fragmentary are actually the original ones from the Ishtar Gate, now at the Pergamon Museum. And that's where these tiles are, but Saddam Hussein decided that he was going to rebuild the Ishtar Gate. And basically, that's what he did. He, 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 he rebuilt it using the same designs that are left with us in the archaeology and in many ways it was probably a good thing that th these actually went to uh, the Pergamon Museum rather than staying in Iraq. But again look at these wonderful designs that you can you know you, you, you visit in a city and you, you're thinking wow what bricks can do what bricks can really really show you. So there you go painted and glazed tiles of around 880 years BC at Nimrud. That's the city that we were talking about associated with the Assyrians. Nimrud is in Mesopotamia, it's in Northern Iraq, and it's one of the great cities of the Mesopotamian civilizations. The glazed bricks relief tile wall uh, from the palace of Persepolis around Persepolis, around 518 BC in Iran. So look at that there. That's again associated with the Assyrians. Persepolis is one of those cities that was destroyed by Alexander the Great. But this is, this, these are um, glazed brick reliefs from 518. And again, another beast from the Ishtar Gate at Babylon. This one dates from 575 years BC. Again, glazed bricks in relief, they, 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 they come out of the flush brick surface. They, they actually come out at you. And these, these bricks with the designs would have probably all had to be individually made. They, 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 probably, they, they, they probably had a large, large square and they had the design in there and they, they made the design and then they cut the bricks and then they baked the bricks and then they were enameled. So yeah, there you go, a, a relief tile of the early 1200s from Afghanistan. So, so th this, this when people have got the technology with bricks, they're, they're really going ahead. So as I've already said, the early technology for bricks is coming from the Indus Valley people. You're already getting them um, making designs of bricks with the Indus Valley people. The, the Assyrians are taking a lot much further, um, just nearly around 3000 years ago, they're taking it a lot further. And again, bricks are important to these people. And, and again, the importance of the humble brick, the mundane, boring brick that you have our, our houses made out of. They were very important to people in the past and our houses are actually made out of bricks. Now, can I just mention this design behind us, this, this, um, th this design that we, we looked at in regard to the Indus Valley people. It, it, it's definitely not a kiln, but th those, those bricks there are actually, have been fired bricks and they're actually of the date that we're actually talking about. Um, and again, the importance of whole civilizations 
using these bricks in the construction of their great cities. So, so bricks, in other words, were now becoming firmly established in certain parts of the world, and some of the techniques being used by the brick maker were quite sophisticated. So the brick maker is a craftsman. Believe it or not, he's a craftsman. He, he's, he's up there as somebody who's very, very important. And as, as me and Richard would understand, the, the building of Barry, when they ran out of stone to build Barry, they had to build brickworks. And they built quite a number of brickworks in Barry and, and hundreds and millions of bricks were used. And if it wasn't for those brickworks in Barry, we wouldn't see modern day Barry and Calixton today. And I'm sure many other places are like that as well. Because quarries are down under the ground and you think, well, you know, you've got a quarry of brick uh, stones and, you know, you've got to make them into things. So it's easy to get clay and to make them into molds. And then to fire them obviously uses a lot more material. So moving on to, again, look at that, love it. I'm not exactly sure where this one is actually from, but a really nice little design there. Not sure at all. We're to ancient Greece. Now, when we look at ancient Greece around 300 years BC, well, actually well before that, around with the building of the Parthenon, when we're looking at the tiles required for the roof, tiles are bricks, basically. Um, and so by the time you get to around 300 years BC, um, the brick began to appear in Greece where it was mainly... <laughs> Stop yawning, Bill, where it was <laughs> mainly used for covering roofs and producing artifices. Artifices are, um, are adornments on the roof. And this this looks like it could be um, a Greek brick, but obviously probably not from the period that we're talking about. Uh, Medusa's head with the snakes on there. In due course, the craft of brick making spread to other parts of Europe and in, and in Italy, some of the earliest brick constructions are the Etruscan walls at Arezzo. And although a kiln burnt bricks were used in Rome around 200 years before the birth of Christ, it was not until when you get into uh, the years after the birth of Christ that they became more widely used. And in fact, Somebody played a fiddle, and that person who played a fiddle brought back the revolution of brick use in the rebuilding of Rome itself. Again, we were talking about ancient Greece a moment ago, and, and obviously the roof itself, they would have required to have had uh, hand tiles on the roof, which is obviously coming from the brick building technology. And we mentioned about the Etruscans a moment ago. And one, one, of the, one of my greatest delights is to look at Etruscan images. And I, I love the Etruscan world because in life they were in the afterlife. And usually all indications with the Etruscans is that they actually used large amounts of bricks in the construction of their, their homes and, and their towns and so on. Obviously that technology going into the Roman world and there you go. There you go. The, 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 the Romans loved the brick. So if you're talking about the Indus Valley people loving the brick, the Romans loved their brick. They, 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 the, 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 um, the fired brick was the in thing. It was trendy to have fired bricks. And again, that, that revolution of introducing the brick to the construction of buildings in, in Britain is very important. So, OK, you know, it could be argued that the Romans um, gave and the locals uh, took and the Romans took from the locals, vice versa, Pax Romana and Britain. Then there's give and take all the way around. But obviously, one of the one of the invitations of technology was brick technology, which the Romans offered us, and it, it's something that we use today. A, a legacy of Rome. The use of brick today is the legacy of Rome. In some parts of the world, the brick is not not what is being used. Um, stone is being used or timber is being used. If you go to Scandinavia, it's, it's timber. Yeah. And, and other parts of the world, it's just stone. But obviously the legacy of Rome is in fact the brick. That's one of the legacies. So the, the technique of fire and brick, um, fire and clay to make brick spread throughout the Roman Empire. And production sites can be found 
in lots of localities. We've, we've got brick kilns being found in lots of localities, including Britain, across the whole of Italy and France. Places like Spain, Germany, North Africa and elsewhere, you, you get bricks, a, a mass a, a, a mass scale of brick making. Now, now what are those who were in, introducing the, the brick to Roman Britain was in fact the Roman military. And each Roman legionary had a skill and one of the skills was actually making bricks. And this, this itself, this here is actually some of the storage buildings, uh, the, the, forum, the forum and storage buildings actually within um, the city of Ostia, the port of Rome um, on the um, western Italian coast. And the, you, as you can see, bricks, these bricks for the, the forum and the storage buildings here, are, they're still standing today. So it, it goes to show the, these buildings were erected around 1,900 years ago, probably in the reign of Claudius, so that makes it 2,000 years ago. So th this is what we're looking at, at Ostia. Ostia, the port, the port of Rome, and and then with with Ostia being a major port for um, for Claudius, what what we what we do see is that when Rome burns down in around AD sixty four in the reign of Nero, um, it, instead of having all those marble buildings, instead of having all those stone built buildings that have been hanging around for a long time to rebuild Rome rapidly, you just get the brick. So what you do, you get the you get the stone, you get the stone that's hanging around from buildings that have collapsed because of the fire, and you break up the stone, you break up the marble, and that's your that that that's in your rudimentary cement, um, and basically that's all broken up, and then that's then you've got somebody manufacturing bricks, and Rome can be erected rapidly and it all works quite nicely and then they've got the problem is is how do you make the buildings that they they're building look like they are marble buildings so what you basically do you stucco it over and you put a really nice render on it um, and that looks like marble or you might get thin 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 patinas of marble and you might put them on the outside so there was this is how, how rapidly Rome was actually put up after the disastrous fire. So fired ceramic uh, products, bricks and tiles were used in the Roman world for many architectural purposes, including roofing tiles, bricks for walling, underfloor supports, the pili for heating systems and so on, for flue tiles, circular ones for columns and many other uses. So they were cheating by having circular bricks for columns and they just stucco it over so it looked like marble that's what they did decorative brickwork for example in elaborate cornices capitals and other architectural features became part of the brick makers repertoire and there you go we're back at bricksworth now this is this is actually an arch at bricksworth dating not from the 700s, but from the 600s. And this is an arch at Bricksworth, the Anglo-Saxon church. Um, and this, this, is, this is just being made from Roman brick. You see how versatile it is? And what you do, you render that over and it's, you've got a beautiful external church. So what you can clearly see is, is within, just in this one image, you can actually see a whole variety of different stone, different types of brick, all being used. And this is coming from a whole plethora of different buildings. And you, you, can, you can see there that the bits that they didn't have the right bricks, they put a couple of stones in there. So it's likely that these bricks come from a number of different Roman buildings um, in and around Bricksworth from all the different parishes providing stone for the construction of Bricksworth Church in the first place. Oh, look at this now. A large apartment building in the ancient Roman harbour city of Ostia. Now look at that. It's still standing today and that was built in the Roman period. It's amazing that it's still there, but it's still there. You know, I, I, I'm sure if we did a bit of a, um, 
a renovation job, we can make that as Archaeology Company's HQ in Italy. Bill had run it, and he would have all the grapes ready for us when we visit. Isn't that right, Bill? Good. So, again, the, the use of brick, the versatility of brick, the importance of brick, and over most of Europe, brick making virtually ceased with the collapse of the Western Roman Empire and was not, not to reappear until... It says virtually ceased. There's evidence that, as I've said, that some of it continued and really started to reappear by about the 10 hundreds. Brick making was reintroduced in Eastern, in Eastern England and it was in full flow by around the 11 hundreds. However, when they, were, when they were building Westminster Abbey in the year 1070, they see that new brick is being used. Now, this isn't Westminster Abbey, by the way. Uh, but they brick is being used, new brick for the first time is being used in London for, for many years after all the Roman sites have been salvaged. At Winchester and St. Alban, relief and other tiles were being produced even earlier in the 900s. Roofing tiles have been recovered from excavations in London, indicating their production was in full swing by the 1100s. So, so brick is massively, massively important. Similar de developments were taking place elsewhere in Europe, and you're wondering why there's a paw print on there. Oh, come on, I know you were wondering that. When, when, we, um, when, people, when, when people are actually creating their bricks and then placing them out to sort of gently um, dry in the sun, or they're stacking them on pallets, uh, what usually happens is that as they're waiting to build up the temperature in the kiln, animals might wander across the bricks in any period. I, I've got some, I've got one or two Roman tiles from, from Kaya Went that ha actually, ha I got uh, quite conveniently, one's got the hooves of a goat. <laughs> and I, I think we've got ones of uh, footprints of a dog as well. They're really in intriguing. But this is happening throughout all periods. And and you can actually see here, I think this is, I think what they're showing is, I think, Tudor bricks, um, where somebody's reconstructed a wall or something. But um, when I say Tudor bricks, this is actually a, a Polish wall. But, ah, yeah, that's right. Here we go. Trace of a, a dog's foot on a medieval brick. So this is actually not a Tudor brick. This is a medieval brick. So older than a Tudor brick. So this is this is when they're sort of rebuilding the wall out of these, these older bricks. And there is a dog's footprint. So similar developments were taking place in Europe as it demonstrated by this. For example, in, in Northern Italy, a number of churches were built in brick. At this time, strong trade links were between the Venetians, the Flemings and the English. And it argues that all of these people are, are seeing the technology of br brick making and they're going into it. Perhaps it is not surprising therefore that as a result, of this close intercourse between Venice, Flanders and England, the craft of brick making and other building crafts and the use of a more or less uniform size of brick eventually became common throughout practically the whole of Europe before the end of the 12 and early 1300s. So bricks are everywhere. Bricks are really starting to come into their own. I think really, really good places to actually see the use of brick is actually places like Avebury. And, and places like Shrewsbury. Obviously, it's later into the Tudor period, but you see lots of bricks being used. So by the 1200s, brick, brick, um, brick was firmly established in Europe as a building material. But the extent to which it was used in different countries varies. So where you go to places like the Czech Republic, you know, and they're still mainly using timber. Um, but in places like Poland, they, they are starting to go over to using brick. And the low countries, like the Netherlands, where timber's running out, what have they got lots of in the low countries? Clay. They don't have trees, but they got lots of clay, so you can make bricks. In some countries, the use of brick was restricted to the building of state, church, and elite. So in other words, only the elite. It was a, In some countries, it was a, like a social symbol. You only use brick if you're a certain person or or if you if you're building a church, you use brick. So there you go. So it's it's on the social scale. So well it, it goes to the, the um 
it goes to the uh, three little pigs, doesn't it? So one house is made of straw and the other house is made of mud and, and the other house is made of timber and the other house is made of brick. So that's basically a social scale there. And at some time, one of the houses are made of stone. The Industrial Revolution in Britain brought about major changes in the techniques used in brick making and the canals and railways, so we're talking about the 1750s, made it possible to exploit clay fields at some distance from where they were required. So the 1800s saw an enormous expansion in small, cheap, urban housing and the demand for brick sword. So uh, the one thing I need to ask us, Richard, right, is those people who had brick factories in Barry, what did they do with all the money? Because Barry is still a dive. You don't want to answer that one. <coughs> In this brief historical introduction, it would be impossible to trace the development of brick in every part of the world. It's impossible to do that. However, it's perhaps instructive to make reference to North America, where the use of brick was not so well developed as in Europe. So when we look at North America, here's a few interesting things. Using documentary sources, it's believed that bricks were being made in sufficient quantities to have already been exported from the Virginian, Virginian colony by 1621 and that bricks were being made there as early as 1611. So actually, I, I don't know, you've all heard of Roanoke Island, haven't you? You've heard of Roanoke Island, haven't you, Michelle? Yes. Uh, Roanoke Island, that, that's the one with the uh, the pit. What's the name of that pit? You think we've got Roanoke Island? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. That's Roanoke Island, I think, isn't it? No, it's not. What's, what's the one with the pit on it, guys? Do you know the one, Jessica? Anyway, don't worry about that. Right. Um, I've gone completely off on a tangent there. Sorry, it, it was the T. So what we're seeing, we think at Roanoke Island, Virginia, um, brick is being used in construction of buildings at Roanoke Island in Virginia in the 1580s. And, and we believe that those bricks, and it says using a... Um, using a, a microscope and was able to demonstrate that the bricks were made from the local clay and had not been imported from Britain. So by the 1580s at Roanoke Island, Virginia, they were, they were making their own bricks. So those are the first bricks being made in the great Americas as it becoming a colony. So each company is likely to have its own story of, of, of the brick technology. So just a little, just a little bit, some technical details. Write this one down now. Technical details. First of all, to create, make bricks, you need clay. You need clay pits. So the clay is preserved, the clay is prepared. Now, this is something else I know about. So Bill, take, take, get a big vat in the garden, right? A, a big, a big vat in the garden, put a load of clay in there and get your little feet in there and puddle it, right? And by puddling, you get all the bits of grit out. So when you've got all the little bits of grit out, you take the balls of clay, and then you put these into molds. And then those, those, those bricks that are made are put into your shelters and workshops. Uh, and they're, they're, they're dried out in, on drying hacks. And then the bricks are fired, <coughs> some are stored, some are used straight away and some are transported it. And that's the brick making process. That's, that's the brick making industry. There's nothing more to it, but, but it is massively, massively important. Hang on, let's change the image. And somebody's asked a question. Hang on, here we go. Let me get to this question. Oh, here we go. In Bridge North, if you could build a brick chimney in one day, you could own the plot. Probably the rest of the house was wooden. It was the time of the Industrial Revolution. Now that's a good point. That that is a really, really good point. Now I, I think I think that's that's something to do with status as well. When you when you build a brick chimney, you might not have enough money to build the rest of the building in brick. So so if you've got enough money to buy some brick, you might build a fireplace out of brick. 
and the rest of the building made out of timber. The main thing is the brick itself protects the fire and obviously that's not going to spread to the rest of the building. So the raw, raw material used for making brick is usually referred to as clay or brick earth, another word. The process for transforming the clay into the finished product are virtually the same for whatever period and region prior to the industrial industrialization of the industry. So in other words, they have been making brick in exactly the same way for 4,000 years. How many, how many industries are like that? Not many. Just think of archaeologists. Archaeologists teaching 4,000 years ago had to teach without the use of PowerPoint projections, without the use of slide machines. And, you know, look at archaeologists today. We're, we're, we're using Zoom. But the humble brick maker is still making brick the same way they did 4,000 years ago. I thought I'd mention that in there. The brick, brick making process involves, and also it's not, the one thing that was missing from that chart actually was it's not just about the clay it's not just about the clay at all that's one thing that was actually missed and it's actually here you need you need the clay you also need water you also need fuel and you also need localities that are going to be stable enough to make the kilns in the first place it says rarely has an extensive area around a brick kiln been excavated, so it's not possible to say with any accuracy a great deal about the brickyard or any structures within it. You know what we what archaeologists usually do? They're they're obsessed with the brick kilns, and and the other the other thing about the other thing about brick brickyards and, and and brick furnaces and so on. As soon as it's fallen out of use, the whole thing is demolished, and then then people move on elsewhere. They take all the industry with them and they make bricks elsewhere. We'll always need bricks. So obtaining the raw material prior to uh, mechanization, clay was dug by hand, often using a specially shaped spade. It was then transported to the brickyard by Barrow. Before industrialization, brick making was in some countries a seasonal activity, only seasonal. And why is that? Let's go on to that being restricted to periods of the year when the weather permitted bricks to be dried under natural conditions because they needed to dry out first it's no point making bricks in my steg because it rains all the time in britain for example clay was dug in the autumn and allowed to weather over the winter which helped to break down the clay and to remove unwanted wanted salts that's really interesting so it's weathered in those buildings known as drying hacks at the beginning of the brick making season around spring, the weathered clay was further processed in order to remove unwanted materials such as large stones and processes of brick making could begin with that puddling. Later, this became known as puddling and was carried out by simple machines. Um, in early periods, it might have been achieved by barefooted workers, me and you, Bill, paddling in the clay and detecting impurities such as stones. You'd be a bit buggered if somebody chucked a load of glass in there, wouldn't you? So what I'd like to do now um, is read this. This is a this is a description. This is a description of a letter from from a person living in in Surrey, and it's uh, 16th of June, um, 1683, describing some of the process. So let's do this. And actually, um. I, I just mentioned something that Bill mentioned last week about lots of uh, brickworks in the Maesteg Valley, uh, the Lindvi Valley, which was a massive industrialized area like the Rhondda Valley. And obviously with mining, you, you before you actually get down to the coal, you've got to make some money. So the clay going down to the coal is made into bricks. So the process of the process of allowing the bricks to weather I don't think would have happened because you needed to sell on those bricks rapidly because those bricks are going to build up so I to be honest with you I, I think really it, a luxury it's a luxury to allow your bricks to weather to be honest with you so here we go this is this is from that letter the 16th of June uh, 1683 I'm going to see if we've got another bit ah this this is rather interesting this building here 
which we'll mention this in a short while. We choose a piece of earth that we commonly call haste mold or a stiff loam, which is a mixture of a little sand and a great deal of earth without one bit of clay. This earth is with us about three foot deep, although at some places tis 20 foot deep, as at Case Holton and several other places, and two yards square of it will make a thousand of bricks, every, every brick being nine inches and a half, when tis made green, four inches and a half over, and two inches and a half thick, and the usual price with us to pay to our landlord a groat for every thousand we deliver out ready burnt. Before Christmas, we begin to dig as deep as the earth allows and lay it as level as can be and end before Candlemas, that it may lie to mellow. That is the hard lumps we dig may sh shake to pieces which it will do either by help of rain or, or frost. When tis thus dug, we let it lie till Lady Day or Easter, when we seldom fear fair weather. Then we water the earth well and temper it with a narrow spade about five inches broad that the workman may hold out, with which we dig it down and then temper it with our bare feet till it is in good case to make a brick on. That is like a piece of dough, such as will just stick in the mold or frame when lifted up and not fall off of itself. So that's a description of the, of the process from 1683. So I think I'll, I'll, go, I'll, I'll go into Europe now. So, Brick making, the requirement of a brick maker were not demanding. He needed a steady supply of clay, some water on hand and labourers to fetch and carry. He would have worked at a bench and used a mould to ensure a standard size of brick. The craft of brick making is not one which is likely to leave detailed records, telling us how the craft was organised or how the brick maker carried out his trade. We are left, therefore, to uh, extrapolate backwards from more recent times when we do have evidence of how brick making was carried out and to make use of a number of illustrations which do survive. So what we've got, we've got illustrations from 1425 and it's, it's quite a poor one. And if we can sort of see that one there, where we've got a bit of an illustration, if I if I go on to main screen screen a minute. Um, anyway, can you see that there? Got it? Good. That's from 1425, the, the, the brick making industry. It's not a really good image anyway. Um, but it basically, that, that image itself, that image itself, hang on a minute, I'm, I've... Um, Hang on. Right, 1425, and which claims to be depicting the Jews making bricks in Egypt, but which seems to be illustrating brick making in the Netherlands. Here one can see the brick maker working at a bench, so he's working at a bench under a primitive shelter. Outside bricks are being stacked to dry, and in the background is a structure, which may be an elaborate kiln or a building into which the bricks are destined. Also shown is a barrow for carrying bricks and in the fore foreground, a clay digging spade. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually, I'm going to, this, this I'm going to show you these images on, on the full screen. But uh, if you, the way we actually see Europeans going around the world illustrated by this is a building from the, from Taiwan. This is known as Fort um, Zeelandai. Um, and this 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 fort itself is a Western built fort, and this is being built in the late 1600s. And obviously, they're taking their skill of building bricks, making these into fort, and that's a sort of Western sort of technological innovation that they're taking around all their colonies. This was actually built by the Dutch India Company uh, in Taiwan. They were responsible for Taiwan. This is Fort Zeelandai. So obviously, brick making is something. 
as a master skill that they're exporting all around their colonies and all around their bits of the world. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop my screen sharing so you can see the extensive use of brick there. Uh, right. So that that's that's that illustration I was talking about. Um, what you can see, oh, you can see it clearly now. So there, there he is at his desk under the shelter. You can see the elaborate kiln. And there you can see the bricks being stacked on these ricks underneath. So obviously ventilation are having to be stacked. And then when, when they've gone green, when, when the dampness has gone, they're then placed into the kiln using their little barrows. I like that one. So the an, another one as well, obviously brick brick and and its its usefulness in archaeology and history um, um, meets no bounds. And you know, the engravings, this is this is from a German book of 1568 showing brick making. And this is in Germany, so you can clearly see the mold that is making the brick. And you've got the furnace in the background. So um, furnished in the background. So bricks are becoming very important. And obviously in the background, they're using the bricks to make the walls of the town. So absolutely great, that one. Um, so that illustration from Germany, again, a brick maker working on a bench. So it's basically a skill, it is a skill. It's, it's one of those missing skills. And it says using a wooden, wooden structure and using a mold. In the background, one sees workmen pushing barrows towards a kiln from which issues volumes of smoke. And we could see other buildings in the background being constructed. Um, what else have we got? We've got this one from the Netherlands. And interesting enough, men and women making bricks as master uh, brick people. And there we go. There's a woman there. I know this looks like a muscular man, but there's there's women at work actually in the industry. So it goes on to say that another illustration from the Netherlands of 1694, reinforcing the impression given to the earlier engravings. Um, and obviously, what, what we do see is little has changed of the craft over the centuries and the arrangements which we see in these illustrations from the 14 into the 1600s could well serve as a model for Roman and medieval brick making. Surviving illustrations become more common in the 17 and 1800s. Um, a letter of 1683 describing a brickyard in Surrey tells that after having prepared a heap of clay, we bring to the earth a table standing on four legs. So rather than hump clay from where it had weathered to a predetermined area for bricks to be made, the brick maker with their portable table moved to the clay. The brick maker with a team, with the help of a team of workers would then fashion the clay into whatever was required. So in other words, they make bricks at situ. They, they take, he takes his table in there, she takes her table in there, makes the bricks, wheelbarrow directly into the kiln. So in other words, it's not double handling. It's not getting the clay to move it from there to there. It, you, you're actually putting the clay directly into the molds, not even puddling it. There's, you know, you're not, in none of these illustrations, they're actually showing you puddling them. And actually, when you think about what it was being said before, so in other words, they're, with what we were talking about earlier on was that description in the 1600s of them puddling them. They're just putting the clay into the molds directly out of the ground. Um, and so the pattern adopted in the 17, 1800s brickyard yeah. was for the brick caster, he's called the brick caster or she, to set up his two stool or bench close to the prepared clay as indicated, temporary shelter under inclement weather, and the brick caster's bench, um, brick caster's bench set up under a convenient tree to which various, various other branches had been added, forming a roof to protect workers from rain or sun. 
So in other words, it's it's a family industry, uh, but it's very, very versatile. And in this illustration here, brick, brick making in England in the 1800s. Spot the man. Every single one there is a woman. Actually, there's a bloke there. There is one bloke, but woman, 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 woman. Oh, that's a dog. Woman, 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 man, woman. Mainly all women. <clears throat> amazing that so women women are very much in involved in this industry so in other words small teams amounts of clay brick making is is something that and, and just just this last thing about brick making actually we'll, we'll finish on this for brick making to proceed a, a, efficiently a small team of people was required the brick molder had to be kept supplied with clay and once he had made the brick or tile these had to be removed quickly so as to not hold up the process. A brick making agreement of 1693 between a certain Edward Cookersley, a clothier, and William Gloucester, a brick maker, mentions a team of four workmen and boys, which a Calshaw points out is similar to the suggestions made by another writer, John Horton, in 1683, in which Horton says that the brick stool in employed four men and two boys and goes on to say that a day's production could be six to 12,000 bricks. So in other words, what have we got? We've got five individuals could manufacture 12,000 bricks in a single day. That's amazing. This high level of production presumably relates to straightforward bricks and to the fact that each of the four men was molding bricks um and back to that other illustration the illustration shows such a small team including women and children almost certainly a family group so brick making women children a family industry and if you're able to make 12 bricks a day that's amazing isn't it uh 12 000 bricks a day great great you can make a lot of money making bricks so if if we ever we, we get problems guys we're going to go into making bricks so what what we're gonna do, what we're gonna do now um, we're gonna we're gonna call that a day. Are there any questions? Yes. Go for it. Who do you want to go first? You. Me. Yes, you. Right. To say something controversial, okay? There is no such thing as a Roman brick. The Romans never made bricks, they made tiles, which leads to the new point, the difference between a tile and a brick. And the answer is in the geometry, because a tile is much thinner, but it's wider and it's flatter. And if you look at all the Roman so-called brick walls, you find that they're Roman tile walls. They used them horizontally and vertically. So let's, start, let's stop talking about Roman bricks and start talking about Roman tiles everywhere. Any comment on that, Carl? Yeah, my, my, my comment would be um, my response here. Roman brick, University of Leicester. Brick was not used in this country before the Roman conquest when the craft was introduced by the Roman army who had before they came to this country a tradition of using brick. Once the craft of brick making had been introduced into the country by the army, it soon spread and became a part of civilian building trade. So I'm going with my old University Leicester. Okay. And not with what you said, Bill. I see what I see, and I see tiles, not bricks. <laughs> we we beg to differ. <laughs> oh, it don't matter. What's what's a what's a brick amongst anymore. friends, Bill? It's still brilliant architecture and building. Of course, it is. Exactly. What about you, Richard, babes? No, I'm okay. Because uh, what oh, me and that. Richard find is lots of Roman bricks lying around Barry. <laughs> My, my oh. Well, I was going to say they are tiles, but they're, <laughs> they're made out of brick. <laughs> clay, clay, rectangular things. Yeah. Call them. Yeah. What about you, Jessica? No, I thought it was quite good. You know, didn't really know much about bricks before. Now you do. But now I do. Now you do. Right. On that note, I was, I was just going to say. I'm going to have my echoes case. Really I'm like, Area. It is interesting what you say about, um, you know, we've been taught, talking a bit about class, really, 
and you know status and uh, yeah you can see bricks were a status symbol you know well not a symbol but they you had to be able to afford them you know to use bricks and um, unless you used but I don't think people built their own houses. I don't know. Well, I look at look live... at Richard's house. He lives in such but, a poor part. Do you know what I was thinking of? of? I was thinking of Tredegar House. Yes. Just think of all the bricks in there. And that was 16th century. And there's more than three century. in that building, isn't there? So that was correct. 1693 brick makers would have four workmen and some boys, but I think they'd have a bit more for Tredegar House. Yeah, I think they would. I think they would. You know, <laughs> just think, twelve thousand bricks a month with, with five individuals. Yeah. So, uh, mind, mind you, if we, if me and Michelle were making bricks, yeah, and most of them would end up being chucked at me. So, uh, I don't think it, we would make many. So, uh, anyway, no, nothing else. Anyone would like to say? No, no. Happy enough. Happy no, enough. No. Well, if you're happy enough, we got one of these left. We've got one of these um, landscape archaeology left, which we will be doing when we come back on the 7th. And then the following week, uh, Jessica will be starting a new course, mm -hmm. which you'll all be informed of. Well, tell them what it's called, because I haven't got the information in front of me, Jessica. Um, on, let me just get my uh, thing up so I know the actual name of it. Blood? <laughs> yeah, it was Beyond Blood and Guts. I know it was that, but... There it is. Load. Um, it's beyond blood and guts and superstition. So it was prehistorical to early modern medicine, um, which is quite interesting because you get to see that you know it seems logical back then, but it's it's not logical now with the science that we know. Are you chucking a few ground up uh, cadavers in there of cats and people? <laughs> no. That's a shame because uh, me and Richard have had got lots of experience about that. <laughs> right, on that note, what I'm going to say, Bill, if I don't see you uh, on Tuesday, Merry Christmas. And I will be, if I don't see you on Tuesday, Merry Christmas, I'll see you on Monday, Jessica. I'll see you on Wednesday, yeah. uh, Richard. So uh, I'm going to call it a day now. And this is my last Thursday for a whole two weeks. Oh, good, Rob. Well, have a rest. I know you won't, but uh, you know. Oh no, I'm going to be book writing. I've got a, I've got a taskmaster who's sitting on the left there. Give us the rest, anyway. <laughs> he's, I, I got to, I got to write. I got to get this thing into order. So, okay, then I'm going to, I'm going to call it a night. So, if there's no more questions, uh, Merry Christmas, everybody, uh, and you'll have you that you information sent to you in the post, uh, which will be getting. Right. Anyway, Merry right. Christmas, Bill right. and Jessica and, uh, and Richard. I'll see you all soon. Happy New Year. Bye. 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 Don't invade Poland. <laughs> anyway, I'll see you soon. So we've come to the end of that today. You know, you know that image behind me? Oh, God, I, I know definitely it's not a kiln, right? It's a wall. But what the point I was trying to make was th those those bricks themselves have been probably date from about 4,000 years ago. And that's the point I was actually making. So the so you've got these large clamp kilns in the ground. And you've got obviously a furnace. You, you've got these you're going to have these capped off and you're going to have a you've got the stoke hall itself um, all the material going in there and then you've got the flue and that that's that, that's what we're talking that's what we're talking about so that's what i was trying to say earlier on sometimes when you when you're trying to get through something you uh you you, you would you would slip up anyway so this is only one more of these landscape archaeology to do hopefully they've been fun and anyone watching this and they want to take part in my 2000 archaeology companies 2021 classes we've got the blood and guts one coming up in in january so that'd be great and we've got all the other classes so there's the website address www.archaeologycumryonline.weebly.com and you'll be you'll be very very welcome to actually join us 
So this is one of my last lectures for 2020, and I think I've done over 400 of them since online since March, probably that. So, you know, if you want to subscribe to my channel, like, and maybe make a contribution in the details below. Anyway, we'll stop sharing now. This is Carl James Blankford. Thank you very much for your support and any comments, please, please make those comments. Thank you very, very much for your time and your support in 2020. Merry Christmas, Nadali Klawin, Klawin, Diochen Happy New Year and Merry Christmas.